we're still in the Kuzari going through our analysis of the Amidah, the Shmon Esrei prayer. And uh, we are up to um, page 308. Last week we saw the prayer of Ritzei, which we had said is our petition that not only do we ask that you accept our prayers, but we also petition you, Hashem, that you should accept us so that we can have this great reconciliation with your Shekhinah, with your divine presence, and that we can feel that sense of communion with God when we're all back in Jerusalem in the temple. And that's the, that's the continuity and flow. And if you take a look at the commentary of the tour, which is you know, written in the, uh, in, in the uh, late 13th or early 14th century, you, 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 see, you see that idea of Birkat Yud Zayin Ritzei. The reason why the rabbis Tiknu Ha'achar Shomea Tefillah, after the blessing of Shomea Tefillah, Shekevan Sheba'at HaTefillah Ba'a Avoda, that as soon as we have prayed, that is the time for us to think about other worship. Avoda is the sacrificial worship. Dichtiv Usmachtem Bevei Tefillati. As it says, you shall rejoice in my house of prayer, O lo tehem v'zivchehem l'ratzon al mizbichi. And then immediately afterwards, Isaiah says, after prayer comes sacrificial worship, sacrificial, sacrificial service. So there's that sense of continuity. We had explained it a little bit more deeply, that it means that not only do we want you to accept our prayer like someone who acquiesces to a petition, but also that you feel close with us. Because it's one thing for you to do us a favor, it's another thing for you to do, for you to do it with a sense of love that we can be together with you. Um, because my house is a house of prayer for all the nations. So there's an intertwining of prayer and offering the karbanot, and that's why Ritzei comes immediately after Shomea Tefillah. Now we get to the bracha of Modim. And Rabbi Yehuda Halevi in the Kuzari had told us on page 308 in paragraph 12 that when a person envisions God's return to Zion, God's return to the Beit HaMikdash, which is what the bracha of Ritzei is all about, he is immediately filled with this vision of being in the presence of the Shekhinah, and this prompts him to immediately bow down and acknowledge God. And almost like, oh my gosh, I have the, I'm envisioning the Shekhin in front of me. I, can, I have no choice but to bow down. In the, and that's the continuity to the bracha of Modim. That's why he said in, this, uh, in paragraph 12, he should at this point think to himself that the divine presence is standing in front of him. And he should bow down before it, meaning the divine presence, as the Jews did in the Sinai Desert when they witnessed the divine presence. He therefore bows down in gratitude at the beginning and end of the following blessing of modim, of thanks, which is a blessing that includes both thanks to God and praise of him for his goodness. And that's how, those are the very, very terse words that he offers for the modim blessing. And we're just going to unpack that a little bit more today. So when we look at source number two in our handout, we see the tour again in his commentary to the blessing of Modim, which is the 18th blessing of the Shemona Esrei. Not the last blessing of the Shemona Esrei, because that's Sim Shalom, because there are 19 blessings, but this is the 18th of the 19. Modim, v'tiknuhu achar ritzei, dekevan sheba'at avoda, ba'at toda. He says, because after we talk about a, re a restoration of the avoda, of the sacrificial service, it is time to give thanks. Dichtiv zoveach toda yechabeduni as it says in Tehillim, that he who offers an offering of thanks uh, gives me honor, says Hashem. So therefore, and the, the whole idea of giving a korban is related to giving thanks to Hashem. V'shochin um, bat chilavasof. And then the Torah writes, we bow down at the beginning and the end of the modim bracha, which there's two times we bow down at the end of our Shemon Esrei, the first time for Modim Anach Nulach, and then at the end of that self-same bracha, which is Hatov Shimcha Ulacha Na'el That's the end of that bracha that began with the word Modim. So you 
bow down at the beginning of the bracha modim, you bow down at the end, Baruch atah Hashem, Hatov Shimcha Ulachana Elodot. You are good, the, or goodness is to you, the Shimchana Elahodot, and your name is pleasant to thank. Lahodot. And as we'll see, the word modim has three separate meanings in the commentary. Modim means we thank you. We thank you, Hashem, for all that you have given to us. We acknowledge that everything that we have is from you. That's another meaning of the word modim. And finally, the Abu Darham says that the word modim means we bow down to you, which is really a sense of acknowledgement. The bowing is, is a physical demonstration of my, my realization that everything that I have belongs to you, or everything that I have is from you. Yes? I once heard about 25 years ago Rabbi Eli Mansour say on a tape, um, it must have been 25 years because no one uses tapes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He said on a tape, and it made a big impression on me, that the chazan is our messenger for the repetition of the Shemona Esrei. And he says the Shemona Esrei a second time, except when it comes to modim, we get up ourselves and say the second modim again. And Rabbi Mansur extrapolated from this why? Why that one paragraph? Because when it comes to saying thank you to someone, you don't use a messenger. You get up yourself and you thank the person. You don't send your secretary. I remember he said, you don't send your wife, you don't send your husband, you don't send your kids. You get up yourself and you thank that person. Very good. Well said. We'll, we're going to discuss that, actually. That's for next week's topic. We'll talk a little bit about the, what we call the modim de Rabbanan which is that part that we participate in in the Chazarat HaShatz and the Chazan's repetition. But that's a very good precursor. Go ahead. Just a technical question. In the repetition, when we say Modim, do we also bow down or not? Yes, we also bow down at that point as well. Correct. Now, we will get to that. That'll be, I'm breaking down the Modim blessing over two weeks because there's a lot to unpack here. Um, uh, just that we understand the, um, the further the more, or more deeply the connection between Modim and the Bracha of Ritze, which has to do with the Avodah, which is the sacrificial service. Let's take a look at the Maharal for just a moment. <coughs> In his Nitivot Olam, which is his moral treaties, um, or ethical treaties, I should say, he talks about Avodah. Avodah, in a more broad sense, means it's not only sacrificial worship, but also means prayer. He says, he, We're coming in at a point in his essay where he says that God does not benefit whatsoever from the korbanot that we offer to him. And therefore the question is, so then why do it? If God gets no benefit from the korbanot because God in his infinitude does not require anything, doesn't even benefit in any way from the carbonate that we offer to him, what's the point? He says, Why then did God even command us to bring a korban in the first place? So the Maharal says, It's not a question. He says, I will grant you that it's not for God's benefit that we offer a korban. Mikol makom ha'adam moser atzmo el Hashem yitbarach. But the process of offering a korban is whereby a person devotes himself to God. The af im ein moser nafsho elav rak mamon shalo shemakriv elav korban. He says, well, you may argue, well, bringing a korban to the temple, I, I buy a, a goat and I bring it and I present it to the kohen in the temple, I'm not really devoting myself to God. I'm not dedicating myself to God. I'm just giving, I just bought a goat and I gave it to the Kohen. But he says, but taking your financial assets and giving them towards God as a korban, mikol makom gamzeni moser atzmo el Hashem barach. That's also called dedicating yourself or devoting yourself to God. Kashir makriv elav mamon shalom. When you take something that is so much a part of you, the, the money that was uh, hard-earned, that you worked so hard for, 
and you give a portion of that to Hashem, you're dedicating of yourself to Hashem. V'nikra ze avoda. And why is it called avoda, which comes from the word eved, which means a servant? Ki ha'eved kanoi l'rabo, v'hu umamon shelo hakol la'adon shelo. Because what is a servant? A servant is someone who is completely under the domination, financially, of a master. The master, we don't have slavery anymore today, but a true slave is someone who is owned by another human being. Right? So, therefore, even like the Talmud says, Masha kana evet kana rabo. If a servant acquires something, he picks something up off the street, it immediately becomes the property of his master. So by giving something of financial value to God, I am acknowledging that everything that I have, really, because I'm God's Evid, it belongs to Hashem. And therefore, when I give of my assets to God, I'm demonstrating that I am God's servant. And I, really, I don't own anything of my own. Not, none of my possessions are truly mine. They are Hashem's. There is therefore no greater kind of service or avodah to Hashem than taking something that is so personally yours and giving it to God. Because you're demonstrating that I am God's property. Just I take my property, which is not really mine, and I give it to God to demonstrate that everything that I am, everything that I own, really is God's. Why then is prayer called avoda? What am I giving to God when I pray? Because as we mentioned, avoda by definition is taking something that, you, that at first glance is yours and dedicating it to Hashem and saying that God, it really belongs to you. As we explained when we explained the korbanot. So when we pray, what essentially are we praying? What are we doing when we pray? We are essentially acknowledging that anything that happens to me in life, God is a result of you, is because of your good graces. And that also is an acknowledgement that I am your servant. I'm basically at your whim. And that's why tefillah is called avodah, because it accomplishes psychologically the same thing as when I dedicate something of mine to God that's called avodah. Similarly, when I ask Hashem to please give me good life, it's also the same kind of avodah, because I'm acknowledging that I don't, I am not the master of my own destiny. I'm not the architect of my destiny. Hashem, you are. And therefore, I am demonstrating through my tefillah that I need you in order to survive in this life. And in so doing, a person demonstrates that he's completely dependent upon the Almighty. Now, with this maharal, we can explain the continuity even further between Ritzei and Modim. Because if Ritzei is all about our desire to restore the avodah in the temple, we want to go back to that sacrificial service where we can dedicate ourselves, our lives, our assets, we want to, and we are envisioning that. So then immediately it brings us to that sense of, well, the whole idea of a korban is my acknowledgement that everything that I own belongs to you, God, and comes from you. Then what does that immediately spur within me? It spurs within me a sense of gratitude. And that's the modim. So immediately after Ritzei, I jump into modim because after all I've said, I've, I've, I've spent the last <clears throat> several minutes asking you for all of my needs. I've spent the last bracha trying to envision what life is going to be like when we have a temple once again and we're all offering our assets to you, Hashem. All of that put together reminds me that I have nothing if it weren't for you. I would have, I really do not own anything of my own. And anything that I have, Hashem, really is yours. My life is yours, my beating heart, my breathing lungs, my, my family, my, my bank account, all my, my thinking process, 
all that I, all that identifies me as me is coming from you. And therefore, that should immediately, spontaneously drive a person to express that gratitude. Not because I have this obligation to thank God, but because it's only natural for me to feel that sense of acknowledgement. And that's the, um, and that's the idea that's being expressed by connecting Ritze to Moti. Okay. Now I want to point out something that we did not read from the tour. Let's go back to source number two. The second line, he says, I explained previously the laws of how to bow down when you bow down. And of course, just like everything in Jewish law, there's a protocol. There's a protocol to bowing, which is that, as the Shulchan Aruch writes, a person is supposed to start by bending their knees um, at when, when you're saying a bracha. And this is not true by modim. By modim, it's just merely a forward bowing like this. But when you say a bracha, you bend your knees. When you say baruch, ata, you bow down. And by the time you're saying Hashem, your body is already moving upward. But there's a special way that the body is supposed to move upwards when you bow down for modim or you bow down for a blessing. And here he's going to explain Beperakama de Babakama Amar that the, in the first chapter of Tractate Babakama it is written, Shedro shel Adam la'achar ayin shana na'asen achash that after 70 years in the grave a person's vertebrae, his spine, turns into a snake. The Gemara says this. Very, very strange statement from the Gemara. You've been buried now for 70 years. Your body is decomposing. And, um, and after 70 years of decomposition, your spine turns into a snake. That's what the Gemara says. Now, there are many people who are literalists and will take this literally. And you have every right to interpret it that way. But the question, of course, is for those of us who are more intellectually driven, what does this Gemara mean when it says that? The Gemara then proceeds to say that why is that going to happen? Why does that happen to a person? So the Gemara clarifies it doesn't happen to every person. It only happens to people who what? V'hu dolo karabimodim. It only happens to a person who did not bow down properly when they said modim. You know, if a person's in a real rush, modim and you know, so it's part of your shuckling, but you're not really bowing down properly. So if you, if you didn't bow down properly during modim, then God will punish you. Mida keneged mida. This is a measure for measure punishment. Shahayalo lichroa velizkov kenachash. What you should have done is bent down and then pulled up like a serpent. Now what that means is, there's a Gemara in Masechet Brachot which says that the way that you're supposed to, from your um, bent position, I'm sure there's a fancy word for this, but from your, um, genu from your position of genuflection, I guess would be the right word, Right from this position, you're supposed to slowly arise, not quickly, because that would demonstrate that you're not really interested in acknowledging God, but a person who is truly showing fealty to his king arises very slowly. And the Gemara describes it, that you lift up your head first, then you slowly pull up the rest of your body, just kichivya, like a snake, who when it lifts up its body, first lifts up its head, and then pulls up the rest of its body. Sort of like a, one of those cobras, you know, from the, from the Snake Charming movies, right? Or for those of you who have been to India and actually seen us chase Snake Charmer. But that's the way that it's, that it's describing it. So that's, the, what the, uh, that's what the tour writes, quoting from the Gemara. V'hu lo asakein, if this person did not do that, lachein na'ase shidro nachash. His spine will therefore turn into a serpent. Again, very bizarre, very bizarre, very unusual, and Ein Midrash Omer Ella Dirshuni. This Midrash is crying out to us saying, explain me, explain what this means. What in, what in the world does this Midrash mean? 
So uh, uh, there's a beautiful commentary from the from the Gera Rebbe. The the I'm not sure what number he is, but the, but Rebbe Menachem Alter Migur um, wrote a sefer called Pnei Menachem. And in one of his commentaries, he says as follows. This is source number four. Itabi gemara legabe kriya kika zakif zakif kichivya. That when you pull up from your bowing state, you should do it like a snake. Vilama davka kichivya. Why like a snake? El lefi shekol inyan hakriya hu lahakir bitovato shel makom. He says, what's the whole point of bowing? Bowing is to acknowledge that it is God who has taken care of me. I acknowledge, God, you've taken care of me. I bow my head to you quite literally to demonstrate that as much as I would like to take credit for all of the good that I have accomplished in life, I can't take credit for anything. And it really is all because of you. Okay? So what does that have to do with the snake? The Hanachash eno makir tova. The snake's quality is not to have any appreciation. That was the whole quality of the snake in the garden, right? The snake says, just like, um, just like Haman said, the cholze einenu shoveli. He says, you know, when, when, uh, when Haman saw that everyone was bowing down to him, except that one Jew, Mordechai, he said, none of this is worth it. If there's that one guy who's not bowing down to me, it really ruins my day. Um, Haman was the George Costanza of Tanakh. In other words, if the, 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 the neurosis of someone who, if one person doesn't like him or will not show him respect, it doesn't matter if a thousand others will, right? He just, it drives him crazy. And what the Nachash was trying to do was to instill that neurosis into Adam and Chava. He was basically saying, what, you think this is great because God gave you a whole garden from which you could partake? An idyllic existence? A world of, to, of your own that you can enjoy? And he just said, but just one tree, just one tree. Don't eat from that one tree. I've given you millions of other trees that you can, that you can partake of. Just that one tree don't, don't take. So the Nachash is that, is that persona that always looks at the cup half empty and says, yeah, it's true, God, I have a lot of good stuff, but I would be so much happier if I could only have X. Right? That's the trait of the Nachash. And as a result, he doesn't appreciate and is ungrateful for what has been given to him to that point. So, Velachain Ita, Shemi She'eno Koreya Umakir Betovat HaMakom, and that's why our sages say that if a person fails to appreciate the gifts that God has given to that to him or her, lebasof naaseh shidron nachash. That's why eventually his spine will turn into a snake. V'hu mida keneged mida uchediita betosvot uvetur. And as as is discussed by the Torah, the Torah actually quotes this gemara. Ish Yisrael tzarich leidasha kol me'ashemit barach because a Jewish person must always acknowledge that everything comes from God. And that's the reason why the rabbi said, more so than any other bracha of the Shemona Esrei, we want you to bow during this bracha of Modim. Then he says something truly cryptic, which is that bowing down at the beginning of Shemona Esrei, and at the end, we're getting towards the end with the Modim blessing, is to remove the kitrugim, is to remove the prosecuting arguments that are both coming before prayer and after prayer. Now, this is a, an allusion to a much deeper concept, but um, as Rav Dessler and as others describe, there are arguments to be made against the whole concept of prayer to begin with. Because, of course, the famous question, if God knows what I need, then why do I need to notify him? If God is omniscient, he already knows what I need. So that's the key trug that comes before tefillah. Anytime I open my mouth in prayer, I am immediately 
um, subconsciously or on some level challenging God's omniscience, am I not? Because I'm basically saying, God, let me tell you what I need. What do you mean, let me tell you what I need? I'm God. I don't need you to tell me what you need, right? So that's the kitrug that comes before prayer. The kitrug that comes after prayer, perhaps, is I've done everything I need to do. Now I can go to, about my business. That's also a kitrug against the person because that person is essentially implying that his prayers are done. He's rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, and now I gotta go. And, and that's all I gotta do, right? And that in itself is a key truth. So the reason he says for bowing at the beginning is to acknowledge that I know what I'm doing on some level is inappropriate because I'm telling you what you already know. And the reason why I bow down at the end is to acknowledge that if I had, if I had adequate ability and appreciation of what you do for me, I would recognize that this is totally insufficient, what I have just done. And so that's the kitrug, that's the sort of the, that's to, that's to sort of neutralize the argument against man that comes both before he prays and at the end of his prayer. Anyway, that's really a side issue, but the point that I wanted to bring from the Pnei Menachem is this, that the reason why our sages tell us this cryptic statement that your body or your spine turns into a snake is because why didn't a person bow down at Modim? It's because he didn't fully appreciate the idea of expressing thanks to Hashem. I think someone's phone is going off, you may want to, okay. So, so if a person didn't fully appreciate what, you, what, I, what Hashem was, was doing for me, then it's important to, uh, it's, a, it's important for them to realize that you're no different from the snake in the garden. You're no different from the, the person who really just didn't appreciate the beautiful world that Hashem gave, like the, serp, like the argument that the serpent gave to man and to woman. And uh, therefore, that's the message. The message is, is that after a life lived, a 70-year life, if that was all you got out of it, is that you could have had more, you know, I will tell you this, there is nothing more pathetic to witness than an older person who is bitter. And I, I will tell you this, because as we all get older, we become wiser. And the wiser we become, the more grateful we become. There is nothing sadder than seeing an unwise older person. And so, if you see people like that, you should have Rahmanas for them. True, true Rahmanas. I'm not, I'm not saying like invent Rahmanas. I'm saying you should truly pity people who are advanced in age and don't see the beauty in life. Because that's just, that's just a sign that they have not gained sufficient wisdom. And I'm overgeneralizing, obviously, because there are many people who have all the good reasons to be bitter. And yet, and yet, and yet. Okay? So, um, I, I think that that's the message that I'd like to bring out from that point. I just want to do one more little tiny piece, if, you, if we can allow ourselves the time. Um, and maybe not. Maybe what we'll do is we'll just hold it here and we'll pick that up. Uh, that there's a line in, uh, in the modem that I wanted to focus on, but we'll, we'll deal with it the next time when we deal with the rest of modem, okay? Let us, let us go on to the, to the Parsha. Any questions, comments? Do it differently, and then my knees stay bent. Your knees don't stay bent when you bow down. Well, when you, bend, you, you bend, bend, and then you bow. Okay, I, okay, and I thought you. It's bend, impossible to have your knees. I don't think it's really possible to have your. Well, well you could. I do that. <laughs> it's, it's quite, quite, it's quite uncomfortable. Okay, yeah. that explains. Okay. <laughs> that explains. <laughs> well, I've been going to the chiropractor <laughs> for the last thirty years. <laughs> Bending of modem is without the, was without the knee bending. But I thought you just said that there's no, you can't bend if you don't bend your knees. No, 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 no. no, no. 
you, you, there's something called prostration, which is lowering your body. And then that's with the knee bent. Then you bow. Okay. That's with the bracha, Baruch Atah Hashem. Baruch Atah Hashem. But modim, it's just the straight motion going down without, without the knee bending. So I'm asking why, why the difference? I have to look it up, I don't remember. I don't remember, to be honest with you. Yes. It's anachnu koreim, knee bending, umishtachavim. Yeah. Okay. Yes, okay. We are the people of the book, are we not? We really need to know all of the, it is, it's important, it's important. We need to know how to govern these things in our lives. Okay.